Okay, bom dia. Obrigada por vir na minha palestra. I thought I would start it off with a little Portuguese so that when I switched to English, even with my slightly New York accent, it would be comparably easier to understand me. So thanks guys. Welcome to Product Focused Development. Um, I'm Melanie. I'm the CTO of AE, and I'll be talking to you a little bit about product-focused development to start off our product-focused development track, which should be pretty cool. So I'll start off with this pretty long quote. You guys can read along with it. Sometimes you're on a team and you're busy banging out the code and somebody comes up to your desk, coffee mug in hand, and starts rattling on about how if you must use multi-threaded COM compartments, your app will be 34% sparklier, and it's not even that hard because he's written a bunch of templates, and all you have to do is multiply and inherit from 17 of his templates, each taking an average of four arguments, and you can barely and you barely even have to write the body of the function. It's just a gigantic list of multiple inheritance from different classes. And hey, presto, multi-apartment threaded com and your eyes are swimming and you have no freaking idea what this frigatard is talking about, but he just won't go away. And even if he does go away, he's just going back into his office to rate more of his clever classes constructed entirely from multiple inheritance from templates without a single implementation body at all. And it's going to crash like crazy and you're going to get paged at night to come in and try to figure it out because he'll be at some goddamn design patterns meetup. And so this is basically what we don't want to do. We don't want to be the guy at the design patterns meetup. And instead we want to actually just get shit done and write code that and design things that have a purpose for the purpose of the product. So who does product focused development matter for? Designers, developers, PMs, data scientists, old Greg, that's just a reference to a YouTube video to date myself. Basically, it matters for everyone. Um, anyone who works in a product can do product-focused development, and it's through working together and collaborating um, and all having this goal of the product in mind that we can actually effectively do product-focused development. So basically, it's about the product. Um, and the, the That's the shit and getting shit done, <laughs> specifically. Um, that means it's... It's about designing things for users. So basically, when you're making the purpose of what the code that you're writing when you're sitting down working on a feature or when you're designing something um, or when you're solving a, you know, a tough data science problem, ideally it's for consumption by an actual person out there in the world at some point in time. Um, even if you're doing, um, you know, R&D for data science, um, there's ideally going to be that's going to translate in the future into something that will impact or be used by people if you're working on an app obviously there's a um you know there's there should be a really clear use case for the thing that you're working on it should be a feature that you're working on should be meant to be um you know to be used by users of the application also for business goals, so people don't just use things in a vacuum. Oftentimes, um, you know, we we develop applications for um, for companies, um, for you know, whether it's a startup or a larger company. There's usually some type of you know hashtag capitalism. There's some sometimes some a lot of times like a monetization structure involved or an incentive structure um, or you know, it, a certain way that the product needs to be marketed, things don't just get into users' hands in a vacuum. So there's oftentimes business goals associated with a lot of the products that we're working on as well. And it's important to understand that and understanding the whole the whole product and the whole thing that we're delivering. 
There's also real world constraints. So we don't just develop things in a bubble. Um, the, we develop things ideally for use in the real world. And so there's oftentimes, um, you know, just actual limitations that exist in the real world that can affect the products that we're building, whether it's, um, you know, we have a certain budget or timeline to, de to develop a feature, um, whether it's there's just, you know, trade-offs associated with different choices that we're going to make based on how things might be used in the real world. Maybe something, you know, is going to be um, a little bit slower for the user, but it will deliver uh, a better result. Um, but, you know, maybe they, they need that to happen um, in real time, or maybe, you know, ideally we would be able to uh, spend, you know, five months developing a feature that would be really, really perfect. But, you know, we have, there's a, you know, there's the, the holiday sales happening and we need to um, have something released for the end of November. We don't have that time. So there's oftentimes real world constraints that I have to take into account when deciding um, the best, what's best for the product at the time. Um, so it is about the product. What is it not about? Basically everything else, <laughs> everything else is secondary. Um, a lot of times the things that people will focus on instead of focusing on, on the product, the alternate to product focused development is um, what's interesting. So this says don't go chasing waterfalls, but an example of what's interesting that you don't want to do is, you know, new shiny tech that seems really cool. Uh, it hasn't really been tested in production app or, 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 you know, has a lot of use cases in production applications. Um, and you, uh, that's probably not uh, what, what should be guiding your product decisions just because like you saw a cool post on Hacker News about some, some shiny new technology. Um, what seems cool and smart. So, um, you know, there's also, uh, I think a lot of, uh, a lot of the alternative to product focused development is, um, is doing things that, uh, you know, seem like fancy <laughs> engineering practices. Um, and a lot of times people are, are driven to do that because it, it also, you know, there's a little bit of, of uh, really this last point, a lot of, little bit of ego involved. Um, you know, you want to impress your coworkers with your fancy shiny code, or you want, you think that this is how a good developer um, would do things. Um, but that shouldn't really be guiding decisions just because you want to, um, you know, like sit, <laughs> sit in your, in your, you know, chair uh, and, and at the end of, um, your, uh, when you submit your pull request to be like, ah, hearty, har har. Like that's just, this makes me look so smart. Um, like, look at this. It's so, it's so great. And, um, look um look at all this like fancy things i used and look at this elegant pattern that i used um and like in the first example like i'm so excited for my design patterns meetup um this weekend i hope there's not a, a design patterns talk right now as an alternative to this one um but that stuff should be secondary to the product um that should not be the, like the focus when you're actually working on stuff unless the product dictates you care about those that's the big caveat so for example what seems cool and smart um, that you probably shouldn't focus on unless it, it makes sense for the product would be, um, say you're working on a product and uh, for, and for because of real world constraints, they're going to be able to get funding, but only if they incorporate um, some type of blockchain technology because the VCs that are looking at them like really care about this budget or, or AI and ML, you know, all these like random buzzwords that we see um injected into products that might be an example of something that because of real world constraints you know maybe we do need to care about what seems cool and fancy because that that actually matters for for the product the product is partially about you know some some sh something shiny um then that can maybe be something that matters but only because it matters for the product um but what about best practices good question um, so best practices, I got this definition from the internet, um, is are a set of guidelines, ethics, or ideas that represent the most efficient or prudent course of action in a given business situation. Um, so this, I think this is from Investopedia. So, you know, it's legit. Um, well, basically, though, I, I'm, I use this to mean that 
um, actually product focused development is the best practice. So, um, it, because it is, you know, it does represent the most prudent course of action in a given bu business situation, or it should. Um, and so basically we should, um, we should use product focused development as the ultimate best practice and let that guide our business decision, our, our decisions, um, when we're working on the product and use other best practices as structures to help you accomplish it. So a lot of other engineering or design best practices should ideally just be used as tools in your toolbox to create a good product. This can be pretty difficult because those are, um, you know, in, in some ways almost like guardrails to, to stop us from, you know, other types of more rigid guidelines to stop us from making um, decisions that would be really, really bad, um, which I'll get into later. Um, so it, it can be a little bit unnerving to sort of abandon, not abandon those, but um, look to this higher order best practice as product focused development, um, because it's a little bit less, it's a little bit less rigid and a little bit more, uh, it's very contextual. You have to make decisions that are good for the given, given you know, situation. And so it's a little harder to do that. Um, but in the end, I think it's it's ultimately what we want to do because that's the like global maximum, which we'll get to in a sec. But um, this is just a quote from someone I found on Twitter. Um, don't use a product because of the great design. Great design. Uh, users, <laughs> people don't use a product because of the great design. Great design helps them use a product. So um, again, thinking about the fact that um, this is similar to development too. Like I've never been asked by a user of an application um, to see the code that I wrote <laughs> and had them remark like, oh, how beautiful, how elegant, like this is lovely. And now I really want to use the app that you made. Um, it doesn't really happen. So the stuff that we're working on, the design, the development should facilitate um, the product because that's why users are going to use it. Um, so like we were talking about before um with the um with the with the with reference to best practices um being product first is how i like to think about it um and this is harder i think than being design first or developer first well you're off you'll often see reference to other best practices like development best but developer first culture will use development best practices and we you know we do uh, well, there's a list of random things that you'll do and you do like do TDD and this and you'll do pair programming, you'll do this, this other thing and this other thing and you follow this pattern and whatever. Um, but, um, and those are nice rules that you can follow, which are sort of um, comforting. And, you know, like if you did it, you checked it off and like, yes, I did that. So I did a good job today. Um, and they can be a little bit more, they're more rigid and straightforward in that way. Um, but I think that, you know, and, and you so you can blanketly apply those across all projects, across all products, um, they make us feel safe and comfortable. Um, but you know, like we started to talk about, I think they trap us in local maxima instead of being able to get it at a global maxima. So if you look over to the left, like those the little um the the lower like red the lower hill is the local maxima and the higher one can be a global maxima when you're on the local maxima. Um, you know, if you go to the right or the left, it looks like you're going down, um, but you need to go down to go up. So I think that's like a good example of being product first. You can achieve a local maxima when you are following best practices for, um, you know, just just other best practices um, that you're just applying uniformly. You're not going to get terrible results. Um, and also, if you just dive off and you're not, you know, you don't uh, really, really do product focused development well and really think about the product and everything and get used to the thing, like that sort of mindset shift, then yes, you might sort of start to see um, some some decline as you move away from doing best practices if you just abandon other things and don't adapt new practices to yourself. But in order to um, get to the local maximum, you sort of need to, you sort of need to go through that process and start doing this mindset shift and then you can achieve like a higher um, a higher, uh, a higher maximum, like what is, what is ultimately, I think, um, a lot better, um, better for the way to think about, um, doing development and design. So it sort of, vent it requires you to venture into the gray area and requires creativity, ingenuity, and good judgment. I think this is, um, 
this is pretty um, important because I think like you, th this requires you to not just blankly follow other best practices, but decide, use them as tools in your tool toolbox and decide when that they actually make sense to use in a given situation. And you also need to synthesize and really deeply understand the purpose of what you're working on. So what is the product you're working on? Um, how are the users going to be it? What are the business goals? What are the real world implications of things? And, you know, take that into your day to day decision making and what you're working on when you're when you're actually sitting down um, and coding or designing, which can be feel much more abstracted. Um, and then you can decide like, oh, should I um, does it make sense to do, um, you know, test driven development in this case? Does, should I what should my test coverage be? Should I write unit tests? Should I write? Should I have end to end testing? Should I, um, you know, do, should I what what sort of you know, structure do I need to use for this? And oftentimes it might be that um, that stuff doesn't make sense for for various reasons and that you should just, um, and that can be scary to abandon things like that um, for certain, you know, for certain reasons, because it's a little bit harder to potentially justify if what you do um, goes wrong. If you previously, you're like, oh, well, I followed all, I checked off all the boxes, I followed all the best practices. Um, and I think this is, you know, getting into the the next one. Um, you're not, you're aiming to do what is best, not what is perfect. And that means basically that you're trying to um, achieve at the best product that you can through your work and make, and this is like the, the classic quote, like the perfect is the enemy of the good. Um, so, and oftentimes what is perfect is, you know, un unachievable and can get in the way of us doing what is best, which is, you know, the, the best being the, the, the closest to perfect that we can get given actual real world considerations, which is, um, which is much more realistic. And also, um, if you're knowing that you need to do that and get at what is best and sort of analyze trade-offs on the fly about what you're doing and consciously um, just always be thinking about the product, then you can um, then you can actually get closer, I think, to what is best rather than um, sort of just trying to do what is perfect. And then falling far, far short of that and just achieving something that's like kind of crap. <laughs> so what does that mean um, for what we do? I think we're seeking balance. Um, so we're looking to not over engineer, um, not worry about the beauty and elegance of your code. Also, don't design pretty shit that no one has time to code. Don't focus on trends. Don't make things more complicated than they need to be right now. Um, so, like, you aren't going to need it or do the simplest thing that could possibly work um, for engineering and features. Um, also, on the other side, don't design and develop features that don't work. Um, so, obviously, <laughs> you uh, this doesn't just mean that you, like, um, write a bunch of shit code that causes a lot of bugs or makes it impossible to develop new features. Don't create a super ugly product or um, after design system. Um, so basically, this means that um, you you're not trying to write super um, super sloppy code because you can't write good code, you know, quote unquote good code. Um, or create like super ugly things because you don't know how to make beautiful UI and you're being lazy and you just like what you know you have you just want to get it done so you can like go play um, you know whatever volleyball or video games or watch Netflix or whatever you want to do. Um, it means that you're um, you're trying to to balance basically based on real world considerations working on stuff that's actually valuable for the product. So if you do, if you write a bunch of, um, if you write, if you spend all your time making your code super elegant and you develop hardly any features, obviously that would not be good for the product. On the flip side, if you don't spend any time at all paying attention to your code and your code is totally 
unreadable by another developer and no one else can work on it, that is also not good for the product. If it's similarly like just has a ton of bugs, that's also obviously not good for the product because you know users are going to experience those bugs and it's going to degrade the product. Um, but in the middle there is like this difficult to to difficult to um, sort of um, navigate in terms of like it is more of a challenge and that but that you can get really good at being able to balance these two things and deliver thing and sometimes compromise yes on having you know perfect code um, and also. Um, <clears throat> compromise on, on the flip side also of um, just just caring about um, doing things as fast as humanly possible. Um, you can actually balance these two things and get to something that is going to be um, you know good for um, good for just basically the product overall. So um, something that has good enough code, good enough design, um for the task at hand and this also means that um related to the next one um um there's we'll talk about this um in a second but basically um understanding where things are going to be um for the goals right now so um you know, there's the, the the way when you balance this, you're looking to achieve, um, you're looking to balance them to get to what is ideal for the product at a given time, and that can evolve over time for the product. So maybe you're first like developing an MVP, um, and then you know that that doesn't have many users, so you're not worrying about scalability, and you're not worried about, um, you know like high traffic but then you know the product takes off and that's great and now we have things that i like to call great problems to have and now we do have to worry about those things and maybe now it shifts a little bit maybe now you don't want to release features as fast but you want to make sure that the the bug uh the bug there there are hardly any bugs at all so it can sort of the the where you um the the point of of focus can kind of shift over time um but we always want to be actively asking ourselves what is the point of focus and balancing um these the the two aspects of over and under engineering to accomplish that that sort of um, goal so now i'm going to read a bunch of quotes because um you guys don't i'm just like some random person that you don't know so these are other people who you do know and they will um they uh i'm gonna read some quotes from them so that they you can uh see the other people believe this as well the organization of the software system should lie somewhere between the extremes of the horrific tangled mess of code hoarders and the antiseptic cleanliness seen in the pages of interior decorating magazines and home sale brochures this is not something i've considered or expressed before though it has always been something i've sheepishly practiced so I don't know if you guys can guess who this might be, um, but actually it's Uncle Bob. So Uncle Bob, um, the, you know, clean code aficionado actually um, does also, you know, acknowledge that this is um, a good, sort of a good goal. Um, mediocre programmers are frankly defensive about this. They don't want to admit that they're not able to write this super complicated code. So they let the bullies on their team plow away with some godforsaken template architecture in C++ because otherwise they'd have to admit that they just don't feel smart enough to use what would otherwise be a perfectly good programming technique for Spock. Duct tape programmers don't give a shit what you think about them. They stick to simple, basic, and easy to use tools and use the extra brain power that these tools leave them to write more useful features for their customers. A 50% good solution that people actually have solves more problems and survives longer than a 99% solution that nobody has because it's in your lab where you're endlessly, endlessly, endlessly polishing the damn thing. Shipping is a feature, a really important feature. Your product must have it. Um, so yeah, this is the session on a lot of stuff that we've talked about. Um, I think one thing also that I really like about this that we haven't talked about necessarily is... Um, there is a that that 
product focused development requires you to also be really resistant to this idea that um, you are s- like, and we talked about it a little bit in the beginning, but um, that you are somehow like less good of a programmer or less smart um, or less good at your job if you don't write things that are super complicated or if you, um, you know, don't don't like working in those systems. So, you know, those, those types of things are not intuitive. Um, and I think that there's also a culture of like, just, just, uh, thinking that to say something like that, um, or to suggest something that isn't like that, um, makes you, people are afraid to do it because they're afraid that other people will think they're bad developers or they're not smart or something like that. Um, when I think actually product focused development requires a lot, it requires you to be, you know, very smart to actually pull it off. And like, it's a lot harder to do, like, you know, sort of, um, to try to get at the best rather than trying to just, you know, follow rules or anyone can set up a super complicated project structure and just like routinely do that and like routinely write over really complicated code. Um, but um, I think, you know, we have to, and I think that we'll be, we'll, we're more effective developers also when we're uh, not afraid to say that things are hard for us to understand. Also, not just in terms of like complicated code, but not everyone is an expert in every part of the system and we shouldn't be expected to be. Um, not everyone is an expert in every single, you know, type of technology. There's way too much that exists right now under this, the under the, the umbrella of, you know, software development um, for everyone to know everything about everything. And we should be able to say that we don't know things and be able to have productive um conversations about it where we actually do share ideas without being labeled as being you know less good developers and that'll actually allow us to be to to deliver better things for the product so i think it's really important that we um also challenge this and acknowledge that you know we're not perfect and that we don't know everything about everything um and that you know this is actually you know i've seen a lot more developers once they are very experienced is when they're more willing to say that they don't know things and i i think that we should you know celebrate that a lot more um because we don't we don't know everything obviously and we'll get to better we'll get to design things that are better for products and build better products if we just accept that um globally and then just work together to you know productively like brainstorm solutions for things that we don't know or share ideas um, because different people know different things and we could be a lot more effective that way. Also, the second part, obviously, um, you know, it's better to uh, per- perfect, don't let perfect get in the way of good. You know, one thing that's that I think is is really true about this is shipping is, is a really important feature um, and we should definitely prioritize that and that can be um, something that we try to, that would, that's something that we try to optimize in product focused development is actually um, you know, creating good products that people use, obviously. So people have to get them. Who can justify the expense of a six lane highway through the middle of a small town that anticipates growth? Who would want such a road through their town? And so this is another example of, of kind of over engineering, um, for something that is hopeful or to come in the future, which is not a good practice. This is also from the clean code handbook, um, by uncle Bob, but this is, um, you know, from the handbook of an agile software craftsmanship. Um, so yeah, I mean, basically we should try to focus seriously on what is the best thing to do at the given time. My advice was not to not worry about trends, but rather use the style best applied for the task at hand and stick to it. Go with what feels right for the problem you're solving and then have fun watching what people gravitate towards. This is um, Dan Cedarholm who co-founded Tribble. It is often undesirable to go for the right thing first. It is better to get half of the right thing available so that it spreads like a virus. Once people are hooked on it, take the time to improve it to 90% of the right thing. Richard Gabriel. Um, so 
yeah, I think this is um, another really good point. Um, if you, um, if you, and similar to the shipping as a feature, um, if you do a good job at product focused development, um, you will have hopefully these good problems to have, like you will run up against things that now, yes, you will need to refactor things later. Yes, you will need to improve different parts of, of what you have built. And that should be ideal. You should have people using and abusing your product so much and loving the product that and demanding these things from you and and you will have a lot more time and luxury to do that once you have developed a product and gotten into users hands and collected that feedback from them and had them start using it um you know in terms of the business probably the you'll have a lot more funding and and runway and things to to do things you know more the right way um you'll also have a lot more information about what the right way is and um, and then you know users will will uh, you'll be able to build something that's even better for them than you would have the first time around. So in the day to day, um, and this is we're gonna have a lot, obviously we're gonna talk a lot more about this and different things. We'll dive into specific um, parts of the day to day of product focused development, um, but basically it means being realistic, understanding priorities analyzing and communicating about trade-offs, this analyzing and communicating about trade-offs um, being, you know, if, if we, we work with clients at AE Studio, so communicating with clients or, um, you know, it can be uh, product owners or stakeholders, anyone who has a, a stake in the product as, as well as you, and also people on your team. Um, so communicating and analyzing about different trade-offs um, and being realistic about them um, and making decisions that affect, you know, you should basically also translate the things that you're doing. If they're a design decision or a development decision, um, th that has implications oftentimes on other aspects of the business. So maybe you can use, um, a third party tool, um, for something and that'll save development time right now. And that you'll get this extra feature and then it'll save like X maintenance, um, time, um, but also it costs X amount of money. Um, all of these things are good to communicate and analyze about and um, bring up to different stakeholders. Um, basically, the driving force of everything is, does the thing I'm going to, to do accomplish the real goals here? Does it further the product in a way that makes sense right now? I think if there's only one thing that you take out of this talk, that is the most important thing. Um, if you just agree to always ask yourself that and everyone is aligned on that being the main focus, then just evaluating whenever you're making a decision, does this make sense for me to do right now, given the real goals for creating um, a good product and all of the considerations that go along with it? Um, work closely with other team members to design and develop the best thing we can given reality, um, and then have an iterative approach and manage technical and design debt. So, um, like we talked about doing the best thing at the given time, um, you know, you, it's nice to try to have zero technical <laughs> debt, um, that really never happens. And then just accepting that, um, you are okay with having some technical debt but it being managed and being aware of when you're creating technical debt and having a, a plan for when there will be too much debt or at what, in, at what inflection points it makes sense to, um, to kind of, you know, maybe refactor some things and remove some technical debt um, and doing this iteratively and working on the problems that make sense to given timelines. Um, and basically, yeah, just always working on, um, on what makes sense for the product. At the end of the day, ship the, I'm not sure if I can curse there, but fucking thing. It's great to rewrite your code and make it cleaner by the third time it'll, and by the third time it'll be actually be pretty, but that's not, 
the point. You're not here to write code. You're here to ship products. Um, this is Jamie Zinsky. Oh, and then finally, to end, a quote from Uncle Bob. So be smart, be clean, be simple, ship, and keep a small roll of duct tape at the ready, and don't be afraid to use it. And look at how excited he is. <laughs>